Thanks for joining us for our webinar on the delayed corn and soybean planting decisions. Uh, I'm Jim Mintert, Director of the Purdue Center for Commercial Agriculture, and with me are my colleagues, Dr. Michael Langemeyer, who's the Associate Director of the Center for Commercial Agriculture, um, Dr. Bob Nielsen, who's a professor in agronomy here at Purdue and a corn specialist, and Dr. Sean Castile, who's a professor in agronomy and a soybean specialist. So we're going to spend some time talking about the decisions that you're all facing because of the continuation of the inclement weather, weather and more and more rain, uh, and actually some forecasts for more rain next week, which are likely to delay plantings, especially here in the eastern Corn Belt. So let's take a look at some of that information. But before we start, USDA made an important announcement this afternoon, and I thought it'd be worthwhile to review that in case you hadn't heard this. Uh, so there's been some discussion for several days now that USDA was going to have another round of subsidy payments related to this trade disruption. So they made the announcement about 1 o'clock this afternoon, and I'm just going to walk through this a, a little bit. And it's a little bit confusing, so we'll try and shed, uh, shed some light on it, but some of this is going to require some additional clarification from USDA. So producers of a variety of different crops, I'll let you read that on the screen, but it includes corn and soybeans. Those are the ones we're probably most worried about in wheat. will receive a payment based on a single county rate multiplied by a farm's total plantings to those crops in the aggregate in 2019. And that's an important phrase there at the end, that total planting to those crops in, in the aggregate, because there's been a lot of discussion about whether or not this round of subsidy payments would influence people's planting decisions. That part is designed to minimize that impact. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. There is going to be some impact, but that's designed to minimize, minimize that. Um, the per acre payments are not dependent on which of those crops are planted in 2019, and therefore should not distort planning decisions. Moreover, total payment eligible plantings cannot exceed total 2018 plantings. Um, Michael and I were talking about this earlier though. If you think about it, um, the way that phrasing is, it does imply that there's going to be an incentive to plant something so that you're qualified for the subsidy payment on a particular acre. So what this could do is, is make uh, prevented planting under the crop insurance program somewhat less attractive than, than it was otherwise, uh, and maybe encourage people to continue focusing on planting um, either corn early or soybeans later uh, than they would have otherwise. So we'll have, it'll require some clarification re regarding how that's gonna work out, but that's our initial reading here, uh, just reading through the basic language in the USDA press release. Um, the payments will be made in up to three tranches, uh, with the second and third tranches evaluated as market conditions and trade opportunities dictate. So the first payment probably occurring early. Uh, in fact, they plan to do it in um, late July, early August. Um, and if conditions warrant, then they'll make the second and third payment. So that's a little bit like the MFP program worked last year with respect to USDA making a decision to split those payments, made the first half early and made a decision later as to whether or not the second uh, payment was warranted. So a little bit like that, except they're splitting it in three uh, with that first payment scheduled to occur this summer. So uh, interesting announcement, Michael. Um, we knew something was coming. They had made the announcement that there would be a, a program announcement this afternoon. Are you surprised at the way this shook out or is this expected? Well, this is actually a pleasant surprise, if you will, because if, if it was tied directly to soybeans, like the like, like 2018 payment was heavily focused on soybeans, that would have been very problematic because that would have affected your, 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 how, you, how you thought about acres from here on out. And, and it would also have affected the people that already had planted corn. Uh, that would have been somewhat unfair to those folks. And so this makes more sense. Uh, it's based on total plantings, but like you said, it's very important to, 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 to note it's based on plantings. And so prevented preventive planting, it's not a planting, and so this does affect your preventive planting decisions. Yeah, that's the way it looks to us, and I, I, USDA will probably release some clarification on that in the next few days, but uh, that's our initial reading. The other thing that's a, maybe a, something to consider is this uh, phrase that says, uh, total payment eligible plantings cannot exceed total 2018 plantings, and that could be an issue depending on how that gets interpreted, uh, particularly for some farms that were expanding in 2019 relative to 2018. And that would be particularly true for farms that didn't hit the payment limitation, the payment cap. So uh, again, I think that's going to require some cl uh, clarification with respect to how that's going to be interpreted. There's really more than one way that could be interpreted. Uh, I will see some uh, clarification from USDA probably pretty soon on that. Um, with regard to the mechanics, they didn't release any details, uh, but it sounds like it will be, uh, they will come up with a single number uh, for each county and then multiply that through by the, by the uh, planted acreage in that county. So we'll see more a little bit later, but there is a subsidy program. I think that's the key. 
uh, for us today. The second one, it's designed in a way to not influence the shift too much between corn and soybeans, but it could discourage you from taking prevented planting, and we'll have to see how that shakes out. Um, I didn't see any indication as to what the magnitude is going to be, except for the total dollars, uh, which I think was positioned as $16 billion total. So that's a pretty large number and suggesting that in the aggregate, um, the payments will be uh, relatively large, um, not perhaps unlike what we saw last year, if they actually make the total $16 billion. And I think with the tranches, uh, again, we don't know if those will be split in thirds or exactly how that's going to work. So we'll have to see how that shakes out. So that's the announcement that came out today, and that's our very preliminary analysis of that. Uh, let's talk a little bit about crop insurance, because I think that's an area that people have a lot of questions about. So let's review some details and then talk about what, what it means. And then uh, towards the end of the, uh, the uh, webinar, we're going to talk more about uh, management considerations with respect to late planting corn and late planting soybeans. So. Corn in Indiana, the final planning date for full coverage under uh, federal crop insurance is June 5. You can continue to plant as late as June 30th. However, that's with reduced crop insurance coverage. On soybeans, uh, the final planning date for full coverage is June 20th in Indiana. Uh, late planting period uh, goes all the way out to July 15th. Uh, but again, that's reduced. And it's reduced by the rate of 1% uh, per day during that late planting period. And that's true for both corn and soybeans. So just to for the mechanics of how that works, uh, if you planted corn on June 10th, uh, that coverage would be reduced by 5%. So if you had purchased the 85% coverage product, which is pretty common here, especially in northern Indiana, uh, that's going to turn into 80.75% coverage. You would take the 95% times the 85%, and that gives you the 80.75 coverage. But you still pay the original 85% premium, even though the coverage level has gone down. Uh, if you think about late corn planting options, um, this is really the, the gist of what we wanted to talk about today. What are your alternatives? The first one, obviously, you could simply go ahead and plant corn, even though yields may be reduced, and we'll talk more about that later. Um, if you plant after June 5, insurance coverage will also be reduced, which we just kind of outlined. Second alternative is to switch from planting corn to soybeans, and that's kind of an evolving decision as the dates get later. Um, the date on which you choose to plant those soybeans will impact your crop insurance coverage. Um, soybeans planted on or before that, at the end of that late planting period, that June 30th date, um, if soybeans are planted on or before June 30th, crop insurance coverage simply switches over from corn to soybeans. Um, if you plant soybeans after the late planting period, July 1 or later in, in Indiana, um, you can still insure the soybeans at least up to June, uh, July 15th but you can also receive a partial prevented corn planting payment equal to 35% of the full corn prevented planting uh, payment. The third alternative is to simply take the corn prevented planting payment, which is equal to 55% of the original corn revenue guarantee. And there are some limitations on that, Michael. We were talking about that before the program. You might share some of those details. Well, one of the things that we want to keep in mind here, let's look at, at, at uh, option two there, soybeans planted after late planting period, July 1 or, or later for corn in Indiana. And so you're, the applicable uh, late planting period is the corn. So that's what we're talking about there. But you also might get your soybean coverage reduced depending on how, how, many, how many days you are past the June 20th late planting date for soybeans. And so that's that's very important to, uh, to note there. If you do plant uh, soybeans after June 20th uh, and, and you and originally was corn acres and you're switching to soybeans, you still have your coverage reduced. And so uh, and so keep that in mind. Uh, and so and so the, and so just to summarize here, uh, the the three main options: go ahead and plant corn, even though yields may reduce. We'll talk about uh, possible uh, reductions in corn yields in a little bit here. Uh, switch from planting corn to soybeans. The timing matters a lot in terms of the coverage level and whether you get that 35% uh, a corn, a full corn preventive planting payment and, and then uh, take the corn preventive planting payment uh, which is 55% of original corn revenue guarantee. It's 60% for soybeans and so and so that, that preventive planting payment is different for soybeans. All right, so let's kind of walk through some numbers to make this a little more uh, clear. So if you have a corn prevented planting uh, and no other crop is planted on those acres, uh, we'll walk through an example mm -hmm. on what we're going to call kind of a high productivity soil here in uh, especially like west central uh, Indiana. So let's assume uh, an APH corn trend adjusted APH yield of 200 bushels per acre on this farm. Um, the average for December corn for the month of February was $4 uh, and so for December futures and that's the price that, uh, yes, that's crop the price insurance is using uh, to establish the revenue guarantees. 
And let's assume you bought the 85% uh, revenue product, which is pretty common in much of Indiana, especially in the northern part of the state. So uh, the revenue guarantee was 200 bushels times the $4 times 85%, that's $680 per acre. If you collected the full prevented planning payment, it would be that 680 times 55% or a payment of $374 per acre. So that's how that would work. Um, if you plant soybeans on the acres that were originally intended for corn after that late planting date for corn, um, assume you qualify for the prevented planting on a portion of your corn acres and you're still able to plant soybeans on July 1, which was after that late planting date for corn, June 30th. 85% coverage on soybeans, your crop insurance coverage on these soybean acres would now be 84.15%, which would be 85% times 99% uh, because you lose 1% of your coverage after that uh, June 30th date. And then in addition, you could receive, or you would receive the 35% of the prevented planning payment for these acres, which would be uh, the original projected revenue times 85% coverage level times 55% prevented planning times 35%. So there's a lot of times in there. Uh, and you work through those numbers, that payment is $130. Uh, and 90 cents on this particular example. So the key question, Michael, becomes will the returns from planting soybeans plus that partial prevented planting payment be larger than the 55% prevented planting payment for corn? And that's really the, the, yes. the crux of the decision making process yes. here, right? Um, and, and really what you're doing there is you're looking at you're looking at what we call the contribution margin in, in the in the Purdue crop budgets or the return over variable cost. Is your return over variable cost for soybeans going to be high enough uh, high enough to justify planting soybeans rather than taking the 55% preventive planting payment for corn. Now, remember on the on that 55% preventive planting payment for corn, I know we have this in, in, in a, a slide coming up here, you might have to do some work. You'd keep the weeds down. And so it, it's, not like you, it's not like you don't have to subtract some cost from that preventive planting payment. And so you take the preventive planting payment, subtract some relevant costs, and then compare that uh, to the return over variable cost for soybeans. So it's not an easy calculation necessarily to make. And it is farm by farm, uh, but that's what you need to take a look at to make this decision. And that's an important uh, point because in, in the computations we're going to show here in a minute, we didn't actually account for the fact that you could incur and probably would incur some additional cost on maintaining those uh, prevented planting acres later in the summer. So let's walk through the numbers here and see if we can provide a little bit of clarity to this. So let's look at the 55% prevented corn planting payment versus a return from planting late soybeans and uh, collecting that partial prevented planting payment. So if you collected the full prevented planting payment for corn, we just walked through that, that works out to $374 per acre. The partial prevented planting payment would be $130.90 per acre in this example. The difference between those two is $243.10 per acre. So the question is, will the expected net return from planting soybeans in this example on July 1, would that, have, that would have to be greater than that 243 minus any cost you incur to manage those prevented planting acres over the course of the summer to make planting soybeans more profitable than taking that full corn prevented planting payment. And I guess just for a little clarity, Michael, we were looking at some of the information from our colleagues at the University of Illinois. They actually did put a number to the dollars they expected to uh, uh, incur uh, with respect to cost over the yes. summer, I think, what was that? $43, I believe, is what they used. But you'd want to use your own number. How much does it cost to keep the weeds off of the, off of the field? Yeah, so think about what tillage operations you might perform or what uh, spraying operations you might perform over the course of the summer. But if using those Illinois numbers, that drops that 243 down to 200 and makes that decision to plant soybeans maybe look a little more favorable. And, and then let's circle back to that USD announcement because that's certainly new. We didn't know what that was going to be before we actually created this slide. Uh, if, you, if you take preventive planting, you may not get a payment on those acres you took preventive planting, uh, uh, preventive planting on. And even though that's a portion of your acres, it's still acres uh, you may not get a payment on. So that also needs to be factored in when you're making these comparisons. And again, that's going to favor planting soybeans as opposed to taking the preventive planting option. So, okay. Um, so we're going to look at some scenarios, and I'm going to ask Bob to comment initially on this. So we're going to look at a couple of scenarios, actually three. Uh, the first one, we're going to assume you got your crops planted in time to mitigate declines in corn and soybean yields. We're actually going to assume no yield reduction. So uh, if we're not past that date, Bob, we'll probably <laughs> be past it maybe this evening. So, 
Uh, scenario two, let's assume you got your crops planted on May 31, and in our budgets, we assumed that that would give you a 10% decline in corn yield and a 5% decline in soybean yield. And then scenario three, we assume you're looking at planting crops by June 20th, or excuse me, June 10th, with a 20% decline in corn yields and a 10% decline in soybean yields. So Bob, first thing I want, to, want you to do is give me a little bit of reaction to you know, what you would want to pencil in. And I know I've, I've heard you talk on this topic many times, so mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about where you stand with respect to yield reductions associated with planting dates. Well, this, it's, to me it's a really challenging subject, uh, and I'll tr see if I can explain myself. But So we know from research around the Midwest that uh, after about the middle of May, corn yields decline approximately one to two bushels per acre per day uh, after mid-May. And so by the time you get out, say, to June 10, you're, you're looking at potentially, uh, you know, upwards of, what, 30 to 60 bushel loss. But that still doesn't tell us what the actual yield will be at the end of the season. So in other words, if the rest of the season turns out to be perfect, and let's say that means the yield potential could have been 260 bushel, and you lost 60 because you planted late, you still got 200 bushel. Whereas if the rest of the year turns out to be uh, really poor growing conditions and, and ultimately the top end yield was no more than 200, well now you're down to 140 because you planted late. So to me as an agronomist, it's really challenging. I, I accept the fact we lose yield as we delay plant, but that doesn't tell me what the actual yield will be at the end of the season. And so when we're playing these what if scenarios, uh, trying to budget in uh, numbers that require yields, not loss, to me, that gets really challenging because planting date is just one of many things that influences yield of corn. And, and, and it's really what's going to happen the remainder of this season that's going to dictate the actual absolute yield at the end of the season. So, so again, I just find it personally challenging uh, to come to uh, work with a grower and say, hey, I think because of planting June 1, you're going to get 140 bushel. You know, I can say you're going to lose 40 to 60 bushel but I still doesn't tell the grower what that final yield's gonna be. So that's why I'm glad we have you guys in, in Ag Economics to, to uh, run with the numbers because I personally struggle you know, with that absolute yield sense of the thing. But clearly, we're talking substantial yield loss and the 10 or 20% decline that, that you have on scenario two and three is pro probably actually conservative. It is probably liberal, I'm not sure what the term would be, but it's probably more than that on percent loss. But again, it doesn't tell us if the, end, if the yield's going to be 140 or 200 or 100 because the rest of the season dictates that. So sorry, I can't be a much more help than that. So I'm, I'm going to give a, I've heard you talk on this topic several times, Bob, and I'm going to give you my kind of layman's interpretation of okay. maybe your view and see if, I, see if I'm on the right track. Tell you what you know. Yeah, okay. Well, I'll tell you what I hear, yeah. and, and maybe I've been mishearing. Which what is good because sometimes that, yeah, go what, ahead. What I tend to think is that based on your research uh, over three plus decades now, mm -hmm. you've observed a number of times when corn planted well past optimum dates still had what most of us would characterize oh, as very right. good yields. Oh yeah, you bet. And, and so you talk, tend to talk about the fact that it's so dependent on what the growing conditions are later in the summer. And, mm -hmm. I, and, and as a layman, I tend to think um, that perhaps we're a little too quick sometimes to pull down those yields in the budgets. Does, yes. Am I interpreting that uh, yeah, the way I, you do? I would agree, because you're, you're exactly right. If you look at the, say, the last uh, four or five somewhat similar late planting years, uh, the end results have been either above trend or below trend yields. Statewide now, we're talking statewide. It's really hard to take it down to a field level, but on a statewide basis, uh, we, we've had some of these, um, maybe not as late planted as we are currently in now, but nevertheless, uh, seriously delayed planting years that have, again, sometimes the, we've ended up above average or below average. And, and to me, at least agronomically, just verifies that planting date is one of many things that influences yield. And yes, we'd all like to be able to plant corn at the end of April. Uh, I was visiting with a farmer on the way over, that's why I was a little late to the studio. Um, and he's got corn planted on April 19th, he's got corn planted on April 24th, and he's got plant corn planted a couple days ago, but he said he's accumulated so few growing degree days, so few heat units, that it is certainly not acting like it's been in the ground for over 30 days, it's acting like it's only been in the ground half that time. So 
so again, it uh, one of the, if there are advantages to planting late, uh, corn germinates quick, it emerges quick, and it goes through early growth stages quick. And so we, I don't want to say we gain back some of that delayed time, but in essence, we do. Last year, for example, we got off to a very uh, late start to planting. We finished strong, but we got off to a late start, really late start. And yet we ended up statewide silking earlier than normal, and we matured the crop statewide as early as I've seen it in 30-some years. So again, it's all about the weather, it's about temperature, rainfall, pests, I mean, everything. So it does make it extremely hard to, to predict actual yield per acre uh, as opposed to, uh, say, in contrast to losses per se. So I'm going to try and pin you down one more time. Okay. So what about... <laughs> You're having a hard time doing it, aren't well, you? Well, I, I think that was good. So um, <laughs> what about recommendations if a farmer's thinking about which fields they might want to switch and which fields mm. they might want to retain in corn? Are there certain characteristics you think about with respect to soil types or maybe past production history on a particular field. I, I remember from my own farming experience with my dad, uh, there were certain fields that mm -hmm. we knew we could plant later and still have a very good yield. Are, is, is there anything to that uh, so, thought so process? In essence, what you're asking me is, which fields are so bad I want to give them to Sean and his crop? <laughs> this is what you're asking, correct? Which can really make something of it. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Turn it over to a good, a good agronomist, right? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I haven't really thought about that question before. It's a really interesting question. And, and I guess I would lean towards uh, preserving the fields that have the better drainage. Because uh, in Indiana, with our, uh, well, usual ample, more than ample rainfall, uh, that can cause serious issues to, to corn, both in terms of crop development, but also in terms of things like losing nitrogen in the soil. So, yeah, I, as I, again, I'm thinking sort of off the top now, but I, if I had to make that choice, I would probably tr preserve those fields with the best yield histories, which by definition are the fields with the least stress and, and the more likelihood of getting good yields, and, and perhaps hoping soybeans can make lemonade out of the lemons by giving off the, the poor fields to, to soybeans. But honestly, Sean, I hadn't really thought about that much before. But I mean, your thought process, I mean, would be the same one for me on soybeans. If I was going into soybeans, yeah, mm -hmm. I want to make sure I keep the, the right. better drain soil. Right. Um, but they can do quite a bit with some poorer fields. Right. So it's, it's interesting. And, and maybe part of that too is if we think about, say, the droughty fields, we know that soybeans, because of their longer growing, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, flowering period, yep can handle drought a little bit better uh, than corn does because it has summer, such a limited yeah. window, so that'd be another yeah, you, consideration. You, you just switch the growing season, go to 2012 drought, and what soybeans did right. with that kind of condition, right. you can kind of flip it in this very yes. wet early, in, right. early on. Right. So, okay. yeah. uh, good question. Now, I also want to ask a question, Bob. Is it is it true that the later you plant, the more variable the yields might be? Is there anything to that? Hmm. You expect the, the, the June 10th planting to be more variable? I'm not, not necessarily. I'm not sure that I would, and, okay. and uh, the reason I say that is because we know with early planted corn and the conditions during the first 30, 45 days can be so variable in late April so and most of so May. So it's not going to matter. I don't think yeah. they're going to be necessarily okay. more variable. I, I, <laughs> maybe one way to say it is it's always variable, yes. and it's always hard to predict yeah. because yeah. of our normal weather conditions and perhaps increasingly yeah. so because of the change in climate. So. Yeah. Yeah, what I was getting at is, is, is perhaps there's more downside risk with these later cor later plantings of corn. Is, is you do you do increase your chance of having a very low outcome. And you and part of that is because you are pushing that somewhat short yes. flowering window into August, uh, which is a higher risk for corn as opposed to the longer flowering mm -hmm. period of, of soybeans. So, yep. you know, if there if there is greater variability, that would be one component okay. of it. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to get back to justifying, justifying our slide here. <laughs> All right. So we're going to talk about yield reductions uh, with Sean a little later because he's got some slides we want to show, and we'll, we'll kind of defer to that. So we'll, let's look at these scenarios. Yeah. And again, we're looking at our scenarios based on high productivity soils here in, in uh, west central Indiana to give an example. So scenario one is basically no yield reductions, uh, starting off with a corn yield of 209 bushels per acre and an expected soybean yield of 65 bushels per acre. Scenario two, plant May 31 with that 10% reduction in corn yield, 5% reduction in soybean yield, so that puts us down to 188 on corn and roughly 62 on soybeans. And then scenario three, June 10, 
Uh, we're looking at a corn yield of 167 and versus a soybean yield of about 58 or 59 bushels per acre. Um, we've got some total cost numbers up there, Michael, and I think this is a good time for maybe you to comment on those because that influences what the numbers look like later, and there might be some confusion about yeah, that. Yeah, this is full costing, and so cash and opportunity costs are included. And so, uh, you know, land, o land ownership costs are, are included as, a, as an opportunity cost, so is operator labor. So those are the big costs that you need to make sure you understand are included in these cost numbers. Stated another way, these are not cash flow costs. These are not cash flow costs, and so, and so you're going to see some negative earnings. Uh, using these costs on the next slide. That's why. Uh, we're covering variable costs in, in these scenarios, but we're not covering some of these overhead costs, some of these, op some of these overhead costs that are, that are related to the opportunity yeah, costs. So we want to make that clear before we look at the, at the actual numbers that are coming out of the budgets. So here's the results. Uh, and we used uh, corn futures and soybean futures prices as of about 1 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, so Dease corn this afternoon was trading at about 410. It bounced around both sides of that number. Uh, November soybeans were right around 850, uh, bouncing on both sides of that number as well. Um, the basis estimates we generated using the crop basis tool uh, on the Center for Commercial Agriculture's website. So those are for, and if you haven't looked at that tool, that's pretty helpful. Uh, we've got basis information going back for the last, I think, 14 years. Uh, for uh, sorted by crop reporting district. Uh, so I used West Central, uh, consistent with the soybean and corn yields we had. Um, so those are the forecast numbers coming off of the tool, basically. That's a three-year average basis level for the last three years for corn and a two-year average basis level uh, for soybeans. And that's based on some research uh, uh, one of our colleagues, Nathan Thompson, in the department has done and suggesting that those are the optimal ways to forecast basis levels. Admittedly, on soybean, that's a tough one to forecast right now with what's going on mm -hmm. in the international trade arena, but nevertheless, minus 64 is what I came up with. Uh, if you look at the cash prices, then you'd have an expected cash price on corn this fall delivery, mid-October, 376, and just a little bit below $8 on soybeans. Uh, the revenue side on corn uh, on mid-May, 786. Um, as you move across the columns, with that reduction in yield, you drop to about 708, and then you drop to 629. Mm -hmm. uh, so you fail to cover those full costs across the board. Uh, the scenario gets worse, obviously, as those corn uh, yield projections start to decline. And on the soybean side, um, you know, a similar scenario, but you're not dropping as hard and as fast as you are on the corn side. So you start off, you fail to cover full cost, and uh, even on the mid-May, it gets a little worse on May 31, and then on the June 10 plantings, you're actually looking at a potential uh, loss compared to full cost of about 185. So then the number that really counts, Michael, is that last row, soybeans, and I positioned it as soybeans advantage over corn because I wanted to get this idea across about um, when do you want to switch from corn to soybeans. Mm -hmm. So that first column, the mid-May, soybean advantage over corn is a negative 63, and that says that corn actually is beating soybeans. And that would have been with a trend yield, which we know is, might not be possible, but mm -hmm. scenario one is basically a trend yield. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then May 31, which is a, probably a little more realistic scenario with where we're at today, both based on uh, precipitation this week and mm -hmm. maybe forecasted precipitation, um, pretty close to a toss-up at that point. When you've got a $10 difference, that's basically a toss-up, right? And then as you get to June 10, that's when the numbers and our budgets start to suggest that there's really an advantage to switch into soybeans. So with that, I'm going to let maybe you comment, Michael, and, yeah. and maybe a little bit mm -hmm. from you as well, Bob. Kind of a magic date here, if you will, is June 5th. That's when the, the late planting starts for corn, and that's about when this hits zero. Yeah. Approximately, that's mm -hmm. about, about when it hits zero, um, and, and so that's that's critical to, to, to keep in mind. And so we've been telling people for the last week or so that if you can get the corn in before June 5th, you probably still still should, you know, encourage you to, to plant corn. Once you get past that June 5th, not, on, not only does it look better for soybeans here, but you got to remember if you plant corn, your crop insurance coverage starts to decline. Uh, and so you get out there to June 10th, June 15th, not only is there a risk of, of, of reducing yield quite a bit uh, getting out there that, that far, but you're also your, your crop insurance coverage is declining. And so corn it begins to look fairly weak uh, compared to soybeans. And so, and so I, I'd say June 5th was about the cutoff in my mind. Uh, when you start really taking a close look at soybeans. Now, another thing I should say, you'd have to also incorporate prevented planting in this. 
And, and with the numbers we've got up here, uh, before the USD announcement, preventive planning looked pretty good. But you have to remember, uh, if you don't get a payment on that preventive planning acres, that changes the way you compare, changes your comparison be between preventive planning and trying to plant corn or soybeans. And let me make sure I understand, this afternoon's USD announcement, you said should really have little bearing on this kind of, of, of what if scenarios, is that right? It has, it has a bearing on, on, the, on the comparison between preventive planting yes, and planting right, corn or right. soybeans, but it, it, doesn't really have, it doesn't really have a bearing on whether you should plant corn okay. or soybeans. Okay. And I think that's a great question, Bob, because coming in... We thought it might. Yeah, that that right. was the big worry the last four or five days or maybe the last week as this mm -hmm. rumor circulated in the marketplace about the possible payment. Mm -hmm. And if it was structured the way last year's payment was, it was going to favor people planting soybeans and actually encourage people to switch out of corn mm -hmm. into soybeans. Uh, if we are interpreting correctly and given the limited amount of information we got, uh, I think we are, but there's obviously going to be some clarification it looks like it would not because, um, as Michael indicated, the only key here apparently is going to be, did you plant that acre mm -hmm. into something? Mm -hmm. And so in Indiana, Illinois, uh, here in the Eastern Corn Belt, that's really going to be, can I get it in corn or soybeans to collect that payment? Mm -hmm. uh, not knowing the magnitude of the payment mm -hmm. at this point. We don't really know how significant it's going to be, at mm -hmm. least uh, with that first tranche. Um, if it'll be one third, I'm guessing that's what it'll be, but we don't actually know that. Mm -hmm. So, Bob, what's your reaction? I guess Michael's kind of hit on it here. Mm -hmm. When you think about June 5 to about June 10, mm -hmm. what are the variables you'd think about with respect to should I keep the corn planter going or should I switch to soybeans? Two thoughts come to mind. One is, uh, based on my years in the business doing this, that time frame mirrors what we often see growers do, mm -hmm. that somewhere around that second week of June, that is um, when a lot of growers just tend to make that decision. So this, this reinforces that, what seems to be sort of a natural tendency anyway. Then the other comment I'd have is, um, is I'm thinking about regions of the state. Mm -hmm. That th this, I'm, and this is partly intuition more than anything else, but I think this decision is going to be much more likely in the northern tier yeah. of, of the northern third of the state than in the southern third because I, uh, the yield losses with delayed planting are, are not quite as probable in the, in the southern third because we have a naturally longer growing season and the hybrids that we uh, typically grow in southern Indiana do not normally use the entire growing season anyway. And so when we talk about hybrid maturities, for example, the southern third can stick with their full season through at least June 10, if, if not longer, whereas uh, certainly up north with a shorter growing season, it doesn't. So. So it would be interesting if we could somehow model that, that, you know, that uh, uh, a geographic area to see if it makes more sense in the north uh, than, than perhaps in the south. But those, those are the two comments that come to mind right off the bat. So let me see if I can kind of <clears throat> collapse that into a little bit of a thumb roll, Bob. Northern third of Indiana, you would be much less inclined to continue planting corn after June 5. Did I interpret that correctly? Especially after about June 10. And that's because we, among other things, uh, hybrid maturity becomes very important in that part of the state. It's important now, frankly, in terms of thinking about switching to earlier hybrids. And, and we, can, we can find hybrids with short enough maturity uh, to plant in the northern third of Indiana probably through the end of June, but they are such early maturity hybrids that are probably, uh, they're probably adaptable to, say, central Minnesota or, or, or places like that, that they're simply not adapted agronomically to our area, in particular disease resistance. So once we get below maturities of, and these are just ballparks, so don't hold me to it, but I'll say once we get to maturities of, say, shorter than 100-day corn, uh, it's a little more difficult to find the disease packages that we need in this uh, humid area of the Eastern Corn Belt. So that alone uh, really encourages folks to start thinking, you know, again, June 10, maybe June 5, but somewhere in that second week of June uh, in northern Indiana to think seriously about doing something different. And so um, and that's, that's going to be a decision that uh, the way this forecast is panning out, there will be a lot of people needing to make that decision if this forecast bears out, or the weather forecast that is. Sean, we're gonna switch gears a little bit here and start talking about soybeans. So I'm gonna 
bring up a slide that shows planning progress that you put together. Yeah, so, so with this, uh, we're looking at the, the late planting. So if you, you follow across the, the lines here, the black uh, squares in that line is just the last five year average, okay? And so typically we've planted about half our crop by the 20th of May, the, the 20th of May being the beginning of this week, half the crop's in and what do we have right now? If you look close enough, it's buried at the bottom. It's a green diamond at 6%. That's right where we're at right now. Uh, as you follow across with uh, the other year, so 2011 and nine, as far as recent years, uh, not reaching that 50% plan until about the June uh, June 3rd or so, so what we're talking about, um, and then 95, so they're all kind of in that spot of the first week of June, and they were late plantings, but we reached that 50% by that point, and then the one that really throws it out way out there is in, in 96, and not reaching half our planted crop until uh, about the, the middle of June. Uh, so this is kind of where our plantings have been, you know, late plantings the last, oh, about 30 years or so, and then I, I've pulled up also you know, what were the ending yields at the state level again? So similar things. So what what kind of a potential at a state level when we average across the northern tier to the southern tier? What kind of yield loss are we talking about? So in um, in '95 and 2002, uh, you're at that uh, two and a half to three and a half bushel mark, or about five and a half to, to seven and a half percent, um, as you might anticipate. That 1996, that purple one, that's all the way over to the uh, 17th of June or so. Uh, that's upwards of 10%. So kind of but, matching up. But only 10%. Only 10%. That's the good news. I agree. <laughs> only 10%. And then you go back to your scenarios that you guys created for scenario 2 and scenario 3. Scenario 3 for the beans were, was a 10%. 10%, right. right. And so I think that, that has a pretty big upswing if there is some, some positives to this. Um, we've had years and fields that we planted late, and it's the last week of May, first week of June. Still ran decently well on an individual field basis. Um, but then even in 2009, uh, late planted was uh, oh, May 31st, the first week of June. Uh, it was actually a 2% above yield trend. So um, we've got some room there. I think it's some of the flexibility that Bob and I already talked about to adapt to our growing season. Mm. And, and then really, as I was talking to you guys earlier, um, what's going to make or break these soybeans that are planted later, it's not the August anymore, it's the August, late August to September weather. So having good temperatures, adequate moisture to get those things to finish filling. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about some management recommendations as people start planting soybeans later than they were planting when they were putting their, their sure. crop plans together back in the winter. Yeah. So this, uh, the big part of the soybeans is to understand how they respond to the growing season. Uh, they respond to photo period and heat, heat units, that combination. As we start planting later and later, as we get after May, we lose out on the potential node production, the leaf production. And so we have to manage for that. And the way that we can kind of help hedge our bets is to look at seeding rates. So if you're a typical, let's just say you're a 15-inch planter, uh, you're running roughly about 140,000 seeding rate the whole month of May. I mean, you might have some people try to hedge a little bit down if they've got a seed treatment or a little bit better uh, conditions, but 140,000 is a pretty good spot to be. If we're running equipment that's maybe not as good in, in metering it, so we'll, we'll bump that up a little bit. But in the end, what we're really talking about is time. So you advance here. So after the month of May, so here in a week, uh, if we don't get in the field, we're at 140,000 for about another week and a half you go every week in June, we're increasing our seeding rates about 10%, about 15,000 seeds every week. And this is going with uh, trying to put more nodes on an area basis, on an acre basis, because on an individual plant, instead of having 18 or 20 nodes, we're only gonna have 15 or 16. And those nodes are where our pods are being produced. So we're trying to just stack the deck on a late planting to make up to have more pod production. Um, weeds, oh, we, we hate weeds, and so you also want to think about getting the canopy closed faster before we start flowering, so that's another part that comes into this. So, so can I jump in sure. and contrast that with corn? Uh, because with corn, uh, it's not the same issue with nodes and, and yep. node numbers and this and that. And with corn, the evidence suggests that there's no need to change population, period. Mm -hmm. And so uh, our data suggests that optimum populations are, are no greater than 30,000 seeds per acre. Uh, and, the, and there's simply no evidence that says we need to change up or down 
as we get into these very delayed planting situations. So I, I want to just make sure no, that the good. listeners understand that because yep. they, they may think, mm -hmm. you know, we're this saying both crops. And no, yeah. I agree. Yeah. I agree. So at each week, as you kind of work that through, you go from 140 for the month of June, month of May. First week of June, you're at 155,000. Next week, 170,000. By the end of June, you're close to 200,000. Again, that, there's some grace there. But if you're familiar with double crop uh, planting and seeding, mm -hmm. we're right there. I mean, and it's at the end of June. So it's kind of it's kind of interesting how those come together. That's a typical recommendation for double crop too. So in your scenarios, have you accounted for this increase in seeding cost? I'm curious. It's a simple answer. We did not. Okay. We did not. <laughs> we did All not. Right. So we held cost constant. And that's a good point yeah. and it's something to think about, particularly as you get towards the end there and you get mm -hmm. those seeding rates up to 200,000. Yep. It starts to make a difference. What right? would yes. that difference be though? Well, I mean, if you're looking at just a 140,000 unit bag, mm -hmm. right? And so that's 60 to $70 a bag. Okay. And then now you're increasing another, uh, another $30. Bag. Another yeah. $30. Yeah. Um, okay. At the very end of that. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. so that makes that decision. Probably not enough to switch, but it's a little closer to closer It makes decision. it a little tougher, a little yeah. tougher, okay. especially as you get into that sure. uh, early July time frame when those yields start to drop off. Uh, and so in a similar vein with maturity, so just kind of putting this out here early enough so people can be understanding this idea of uh, variety or, or maturity change. So Bob's talking a little bit on mm -hmm. this, the corn side. On the soybean side, I have broken it down. Uh, northern tier, the central tier, southern tier, um, third-ish, if you want to put it in that way. For a full season variety in our northern tier, we're good we're until about the middle of June. After that point, the recommendation, we drop back a half unit. And then we can maintain that until about the end of June, so basically another two weeks. And then at that point, we're under the same scenario that you described. All right, are we going to be able to get this crop matured mm -hmm. in the northern tier with a later planting? And so that, that starts to come in. If we get to that point, uh, I'm guessing we'll probably have another webinar to address all of that. <laughs> um, but for now, just kind of look at you're good to maintain your full seasons from the 15th to the 25th of June going from north to south. And if you want to do anything, uh, back it off a half a unit. So. Bob, this is a good time to maybe think about on the corn side, when do you switch those hybrids? Yeah, I, I was going to jump in and, and offer to do that. So, and I apologize for not having slides. I ran into stumbling blocks today and a bunch of phone calls and not a good excuse. But um, I will say to begin with uh, on my Chat and Chew uh, Cafe website, which if you're not familiar with it, just Google Purdue Corn Cafe and, and you'll find it. I've got an article there on hybrid decision, hybrid maturity decision making with delayed planting that goes through the process of how to make this a decision. But let me just briefly read from some notes that I made. So in the northern uh, two or three tiers of counties as of now, uh, folks need to be talking to their seed dealers and talking about availability of early maturity hybrids. In general, um, well, and, and I talk about hybrid maturities in terms of growing degree days to black layer as opposed to days to maturity because GDDs mm -hmm. are simply a much more precise way to talk about maturities. And you can have two hybrids that are each 110 day uh, rated hybrids, but they may have pretty dramatically different GDDs to black layer. So I'm, I'm talking GDDs here. Uh, so in the northern two or three tiers of, of the state, uh, right now, um, the safe hybrid maturities uh, through about the 10th of June uh, would be no greater than 2,600 GDDs to black layer. That's roughly equivalent to 105 day hybrids. And I say roughly because again, it's not precise. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because of the shorter growing season mm -hmm. that they face up there. Um, and when I say safe, that's also meaning it's gonna mature before killing freeze. Now we're talking mid-October uh, and maturing corn and 30% moisture in mid-October. And, and so for some people, they're gonna back off even more than that to get corn drier to harvest. East central, East central Indiana is somewhat similar because of its higher elevation. It tends to have a little bit shorter growing season than say central and west central. So, so the growers in East central Indiana need to be uh, thinking about this now too. And, and through again, through about the uh, well, through the end of the month, uh, they can stick with hybrids that are roughly 2,700 GDDs to black layer. And by that, uh, say, up through the 10th of June, that full second week of, of June, uh, that drops to hybrids with no greater than 2,600 GDDs. And, and again, that's roughly 105-day corn. Uh, 
uh, central and west central Indiana, because we have a bit longer growing season, uh, we've got more breathing room and, and we can stick with hybrids upwards of say 2700 GDD ratings uh, or fewer through June 10. And 2700 GDDs is roughly equivalent to 110, 111 day corn, which is not uncommon for people to use normally. And then I've already mentioned that southern half of Indiana, because of the longer growing season, they have a long time uh, to stick with their full season hybrids. And, and yes, they're going to have yield losses because of delayed planting, but in terms of maturity and growing season, they've got a lot more breathing room in southern uh, half of Indiana. So the, the key is, is northern tier now, east central, uh, and then to a certain degree central and west central. So. And as I mentioned earlier, as, as you switch into hybrids that are earlier than you normally plant, make sure that you're also looking for the disease package, and in particular, disease resistance to gray leaf spot and northern corn leaf blight, because if, we, if you have uh, early hybrids, early maturity hybrids with, uh, let's say, even just less than adequate disease resistance, uh, that may uh, make you more prone to needing foliar fungicide and, and that additional cost. Uh, and so if you can avoid that by choosing good disease resistance, uh, you're a step ahead with that. So Bob, uh, I know you talk to a lot of people. Um, as you visit with people in the industry, uh, are we going to have adequate seed supplies of some of these shorter hybrids? I know individual companies are going to vary, but as an industry, what's your perception? As you might imagine, that's going to vary by seed company. Um, and it's also going to depend on how many thousands of acres how many millions of acres are we talking about switching? You know, this, again, in my career, I, I've experienced these late planting seasons that Sean mentioned stuff and, and whatnot, but what I have not experienced much of at all is this statewide uh, effect. It's not just areas of the state that are delayed planting. There's people all over the state experiencing delayed planting. So, so there could be a greater demand for switching out hybrid maturities this year than we've seen before. And that's where it's gonna be very dependent company to company. And, and I know I've heard through the grapevine that yes, there, you know, there are a lot of scrambling going on and for particular numbers or, or this and that. And that's why if, if, again, the folks in the northern two or three county tier, if you've not been talking to your seed dealer mm -hmm. yet, now is the time to be talking to them and finding out what availability of, of high, earlier hybrids do they have because if you wait for another week, uh, your selection may really, really be poor at that point. So it's, it's really important for that northern tier of growers to be visiting with their seed dealers now. Okay. Just kind of a take, uh, kind of a take home message from what Bob was talking about. I think we need to modify slightly uh, our comparison of, of corn and soybean for the southern part of the state. You probably can hang with corn a little longer down there, maybe up to June 10th. Is oh, easily. Yeah. Easily, yes. Yeah. Okay. Also, I was, I was going to put Jim on the spot here, <laughs> if, I, if, I, if I might. Um, the corn-soybean relationship has changed quite a bit, even recently. <clears throat> is, how, does this, how does this change the way we think about this corn versus a soybean profitability? And in particular, I don't think this is putting you on the spot too much, uh, does one of them have more of an upside and one of them have more of a downside? What's your thoughts on this? The upside from a marketing standpoint is clearly on the corn side, right? Because it looks like we're going to pull some acres away from corn, uh, maybe tighten up the supply a little bit. Um, and we've seen that with respect to what's taken place in the futures market recently. On the soybean side, uh, the failure to negotiate a trade agreement with China is huge. Um, it looks like we're setting ourselves up for the second year in a row of effectively not being in the Chinese market. We're coming into the year with a very burdensome carryover supply in soybeans, which is probably going to be exacerbated. Um, we haven't really thought through yet or had a chance to think too much about what today's USDA announcement means, but I suspect it means a few more soybean acres than what we were looking at before 12 noon today because of this apparent incentive to keep the planter rolling a little longer in the season. Uh, that's going to be the big debate here these next few days, as, and your USDA is going to have to provide, I think, some clarification with respect to how those payments are going to be computed. But if our interpretation is on track, it's going to discourage prevented plantings. It wouldn't. Um, they've tried to structure it, and apparently have structured it in a way that doesn't necessarily favor switching to soybeans sooner. Yeah. 
uh, which is what a lot of people are worried about. Mm -hmm. But it does suggest that people that get towards the end of that planting window might wind up stretching it a little farther. Whether or not that's germane will depend on what the weather is uh, in mid to late June, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. If the weather clears up, it mm -hmm. really won't have any impact, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but if we're stretching that window out at the end and people are trying to decide in late June uh, perhaps the very first few days of July, whether or not they want to stretch their planting window another couple of three days, um, it could have some impact there. But that remains to be seen. That's really yeah. kind of a, a what if, depending on what the yeah. weather is. The reason is I asked that question, I, I think there's a danger of pulling the plug too soon on corn. I know you don't want to get those large potential uh, declines in corn as you get into middle, mid part of June, but don't give up on corn too early because corn does look like it's, it, if the yield drops are not very big, particularly in southern Indiana, mm -hmm. corn does look like it's more profitable and has less downside risk uh, than soybeans. And so this is a tough decision this year, but, uh, but I think there is a danger of pulling the plug too soon on corn. That's you, a good, good point. Do you have any idea how many acres of, of additional soybeans would, it would take to have a major downside mm -hmm. impact? I mean, not just Indiana, because you know, obviously it's much of the Midwest mm -hmm. that's under this same... Uh, well, I think, truthfully, I think part of the futures market's already anticipated some of that. You know, if you think about what's taken yeah. place with the declines we've seen, I, there's really been two things, I think, driving the declines in soybeans in, in recent days. And one is the failure to negotiate a trade agreement with, with China. Mm -hmm. But probably the bigger one has really been this expectation that we're going to see okay. some acreage shift taking place, okay. uh, fewer acres of corn, and at least some of those acres winding up as, as soybean acres. And I think that, that accounts for some of the erosion in mm -hmm. soybean prices. Mm -hmm. um, let's kind of wrap up some things. I think, Sean, maybe we had a, a couple of sides f uh, for you. Or yeah, it just uh, real quick. And, uh, and again, it's a steel that with soybeans, we run everything from 30 inch to 15 to twin 30s to drills. Uh, if possible with our later plantings, we're all about trying to harvest sunlight, get a canopy closed. So narrow rows is definitely a way to go. Uh, you're asking Bob about uh, whether the ag economic guys here had brought in uh, seeding costs. Well, seed treatment's going to come mm -hmm. into play too, right? And mm -hmm. so if we're still wet, uh, fungicide seed treatment's probably mm -hmm. still a good thing. Wet and warm. Wet and warm. I mean, because we hit both, right? I got mm -hmm. a wet and warm mm -hmm. or cool and wet, but mm -hmm. wet and warm, think about mm -hmm. Phytophthora. Uh, that's still probably going to be a good scenario, but you and I, Jim, were talking earlier about some, some growers or facilities having their own seed treater, so still haven't run them yet, so they could pull back the seed treatment and gain that $10, $13, $15 dollars back. So some, some considerations there on the seed treatment, and then if they do to switch from your corn mm -hmm. to, to beans, or beans after beans, so there, there's another, there's mm -hmm. a lot more to this. Yeah. Um, it's not and, an easy decision. And, and some no. parts of the state, we've already had two, two years that's in right. a row of beans. Yeah, that's so. right. Yeah. That's right. So these are just some of those final thoughts on late plantings with soybeans. Mm -hmm. So let's see if we can wrap up. And Michael kind of alluded to this. Uh, I think coming in for most of Indiana, and if Bob or Sean, if you disagree, let me know. But in most of Indiana, um, keep planting corn if it looks feasible up through that first crop insurance date, which is June 5. In other words, it doesn't look like for, if you were planning on putting those acres in corn, probably stick with it through June 5. Uh, yield reductions are in that early part of June are variable, right? Mm -hmm. A little hard to mm -hmm. forecast. Mm -hmm. uh, on average, lower than what were our optimum planting date, but still potential for pretty good yields in much of Indiana, depending on weather conditions. Right. June 5 to June 10 starts to get a little more iffy. Uh, Bob, if I heard you right, if you're in the southern third of the state, you would definitely keep planting corn. Did I kind of catch that or not? I'd say agronomically, there's no problem. Okay. You guys tell me if it's economic. <laughs> Agronomically, okay. especially for full season, too. Yes, well, yeah, full season, yeah, without even switching yeah. to early. Okay. Yeah. So let me, let me rephrase that. I guess I would say <laughs> you'd be more favorable to keep planting corn yes. in the southern third of the state in that June 5 to June 10 window. Yes. Central part of the state, maybe a little less so. Little and, then the, and then the northern third is when it gets pretty sketchy. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then as we think about this decision about prevented planting versus uh, uh, continuing to plant at the end of June and in early July, whether or not you plant soybeans, uh, we walked through the numbers. Um, Michael's right, I guess, as we, as or Bob pointed out, uh, the fact that we didn't account for the increase in seeding cost as you get into that late June would bring that, make that soybean alternative look a little less favorable than what we showed in the slide. Uh, but for most people, Staying away from prevented planting is probably going to be this, the route. Um, there's been a lot of discussion in the ag press recently about the favorability of a prevented planting. Uh, 
Um, our bias is to maybe not look at that quite as strongly as some people are suggesting. Today's USDA announcement maybe pushes us even a little farther in that territory. Do you agree with that, Michael? Yes, I, there might be fields. I mean, there's going to be fields that are extremely wet and aren't going to dry down very much. There may be a field here and there, that more than we typically see in Indiana. But to see whole farms go into preventive planting, I just, I just don't see that. Yeah. A um, couple of things about preventive planting. We did some checking this afternoon, so maybe a couple of things if you're thinking about that. Uh, if you do plan to take a preventive planting on a particular field, uh, you need to talk to your crop insurance agent um, quickly. I think the rule there is 72 hours. So make sure you're in touch with your crop insurance agent on that on that topic. Uh, there is the 2020 rule. Uh, the 2020 rule is an individual field. Uh, if you wanted to have a claim a partial prevented planting, it has to be at least 20% of the field. And then the secondary part of that is that 20% has to be at least 20 acres. So just to think about that, if you have a 100-acre field, the 2020 rule would be um, the, the smallest amount of preventative planting you could take on that particular field to be a 20-acre uh, uh, portion of that field. Anything less than that wouldn't qualify. Um, am I leaving anything out on the crop insurance side, Mike? I think that covers it. Okay. All right, so that kind of wraps up our discussion today. Uh, Bob pointed out the uh, Chat and Chew Cafe is a great site for some agronomic information. We'll put a link on our site as well, Bob. Great. Uh, and make that easy to find because uh, there's probably going to be more information mm -hmm. coming out because it doesn't look like we're going to plant very much for, uh, very quickly. Uh, and we'll, we'll update our budgets and, and put some updated information in. I think we'll probably aim to try and get that out on Friday, uh, the 24th of, of uh, May. So with that, I'm going to kind of wrap up. Um, I mentioned the crop basis tool. As you're thinking about those market alternatives and as futures prices change and you want to update things, that crop basis tool can be pretty helpful. Uh, you can use that as a way to forecast what you're doing, uh, what's likely to take place, and not only uh, what's taking place for fall. Uh, we did a number of workshops this past winter where we looked at the possibility of storing corn. Uh, the returns um, uh, for both corn and soybeans actually look a little more favorable if you have the storage facilities and think about storing that grain out into the spring of, uh, of uh, 2020. So you might think about it from that standpoint as well. So with that, on behalf of my colleagues and on behalf of the Center for Commercial Agriculture, thanks for joining us.